Tonight we're in Clacton-on-Sea in Essex where counting is now underway in the by-election that was held here today. Welcome to Question Time. So welcome to you watching at home, welcome to our audience here and to our panel tonight, the Conservative Communities and Local Government Secretary Eric Pickles, Labour's Deputy Leader Harriet Harman, UKIP's Economic Spokesman recently elected to the European Parliament, Patrick O'Flynn, the Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democrats, Malcolm Bruce, and the novelist and broadcaster, Jeanette Winterson. And if you can, do join in this debate by text or by Twitter. You probably know our hashtag, BBCQT. Follow us at BBC Question Time. You can text comments to 83981. Use the red button to see what others are saying. And Clacton is one of two by-elections that are taking place today, or have taken place, I should say. The other, Haywood and Middleton in Greater Manchester. And we'll be getting news from there where the count is happening uh, during this programme. If we get something indicating who's won. We may get nothing though, but we'll be on the air with other programmes later. So we do get a result, perhaps in the early hours of Friday. Let's have our first question tonight. It's from Edward Dwan, please. Edward Dwan. The main parties insult UKIP supporters by claiming they are protesting against Westminster. Why not acknowledge that a substantial proportion of the public just prefer their policies? OK, main parties insult UKIP saying they're just protesting. Why not acknowledge a substantial proportion of the public just prefer their policies. Harriet Harman. Well, it's always invidious to actually ask somebody who's, you know, obviously a strong proponent of one party, what's in the minds of people when they vote actually a different party. But all I can well, tell you... Well, they're all mad, clearly. No. <laughs> all I can tell you is, you know, what people have said to me, and sometimes uh, people who've previously voted Labour, saying, well, I'm not going to vote for you this time because I think you need a good shake-up. And that is what people have actually you know, said to me to my face and I listen to what people say. And I can see that it comes out of a sense of feeling that you know, all the politicians in Westminster are living on a different planet and don't understand their lives and that things are getting harder financially. And there's a sense that, well, somehow the system needs a shake-up. But that might well be the case, but the question is whether or not the policies that UKIP are putting forward are actually the solution to those problems. And I profoundly understand the concerns people have that make them feel despairing or angry, but I profoundly disagree with the proposals that UKIP are putting forward. What are the I... proposals that UKIP are putting forward that you think, as a political observer and practitioner, are the most attractive? <laughs> well, well, the most attractive? Yes, to the voter. Well, I don't think to their not. Um, I don't find any of their. No, I know you don't. I'm going to say what I find unattractive. No, I was asking them. you what you think attracts people to UKIP. Well, what are I the think policies that, that attract people? Well, I, you know, you'll have to have Patrick saying what he thinks that is attractive about them. But I think that they are, as, as I've said, that people see them as outsiders and therefore uh, giving people uh, a kick up the backside. But I think that the reality is the policies that are being put forward would make the problems that people have and the struggles they have in their lives actually worse rather than better. And I think as UKIP advances, and if it, like tonight, gets a Member of Parliament, people will look at those policies more seriously and they'll say, are these people really, have they really got the policies that would help the health service, our economy, the situation in my local area? And I think when that comes to, to the fore, then I think that, that you know, there, there, there won't be such popularity. But we can't be complacent because for everybody who is voting for UKIP because they feel disaffected, that is a challenge to us to actually give them confidence that our policies actually can make a difference to their lives. All right. Go on, far away. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think they are madness, the policies of UKIP, because one of their main policy is withdrawal of membership of the EU. And they believe that by withdrawing our membership of the EU, it will prevent free flow of citizens from EU countries into the UK. How do they, how do they assume that is going to happen? That they, they, they're going to stop this flow of EU 
citizens into the UK. Do you want, do you want the flow stopped? Well, they, they won't be able to stop the flow of citizens if they want to trade with the EU still. OK. Well, let's come to you, Patrick O'Flynn. I was going to come to Eric Pickles, but I'll come to you, Patrick O'Flynn. Um, well, so First of all, do you believe that uh, people uh, insult you, that UKIP by saying there aren't substantial policies that people prefer? And it's just protest, like Harriet was saying? Well, I, I understand the questioner was coming, or seemed to be coming from a slightly sympathetic vantage point, but I, I wouldn't demur from the idea that there's an element of protest against the, uh, the, what we call in UKIP, the Lib Lab Con, and I would say there's a lot to protest about. But I think that support for my party is growing for many more reasons than that, I think. Over the last couple of years, our leader is the one who's grown in stature. Uh, people remember him taking apart Malcolm's leader over two hour-long television debates, one of which you expertly invigilated yourself, David. Don't and carry uh, favour with the chairman. <laughs> it's always worth a try. Now, um, the gentleman hit, hit the nail on the head about what I think is the number one reason why the British public or large elements of them are turning to us, because... They have understood that our membership of the EU, many, many parts of which they object to, the essential thing that's driving support for us is many working people across this country uh, understand that we cannot control the volume or quality of immigration from more than two dozen neighbouring countries and it's having a massive effect on a whole swathe of areas of public life, our public service provision, our cultural cohesion, uh, sort of almost any, anything. It's like staging a public event, staging your wedding and just saying anyone can come. I mean, how do you know how much to cater for? The whole thing is chaos. We cannot plan our public services. The Labour Party left us with an enormous shortfall in school places and, and now has the cheat to, to blame the coalition for that. But that was largely as a result of the volume of immigration that came through. And it's very easy, I think, for middle-class people who aren't at the sharp end of this to cloak themselves with a sense of moral superiority about, oh, aren't UKIP nasty, they don't want more migrants. Well, it's not the case. We just want to bring a bit of order and planning to our migration. I would like UKIP to be the party that gives immigration a good name again by introducing a points-based system similar to Australia that treats the whole world on a level playing field about what you can do, what skills you can bring, what investment you can bring. It just does not make sense to have more than two dozen neighbouring countries, particularly many of them in the Eurozone, which is about to go into its third recession, and have no controls at all, all right. over the volume and quality of investment. Right. Eric Pickle, a number of hands up, keep them up and I'll come to you in a moment. Eric well, I, I live in optimistic hope that a Conservative bill will be returned tonight, but I fear I will be disappointed. Um, but if there is going to be um, uh, a, a UKIP uh, Member of Parliament here, we're looking for policies, I'll just give you maybe three policies that, uh, that might be attractive. The first one is that uh, the leader, Mr Farage, has said uh, that only uh, UKIP would have the courage to make significant <coughs> cuts in the National Health Service and yet he, uh, in the by-election uh, in the north of England he's putting up posters saying that only UKIP would save. Patrick stands up at this conference and say he's going to pay for all these various things by a luxury tax. And before the nation gets an opportunity to hoard Gucci handbags or Ralph Lauren's uh, scarves, that's, uh, that's removed. And we may well have elected a member of parliament that on the record is saying that if we leave the EU, he wants to see free, unfettered migration into this country because he believes in the mobility of labour. But the honest truth is this, that the only way in which the British people will get a choice about whether or not to stay in the EU is if they vote Conservative at the next election because we're the only party that is capable of, of delivering that and we have made that patch very clear. And come May, the people of Clacton, as the rest of, of uh, the country, will have a choice of whether they want to see Mr Miliband walk through the door of number 10 or David Cameron through walk through the door of number 10 and UKIP is in the way of doing that. Right. Uh, um... <laughs> Mm. I, I come to in just a moment, but Patrick O'Flynn, can you just clear up that rather... Well, in, in, no, I haven't asked you yet. The, the, the interesting point about the luxury mm. tax. You, you appeared to announce this luxury tax, as Eric Pickles says, on, on high designer goods and things at 25%, and two days later, your leader said 
As far as I'm concerned, it's dead. It was a discussion point yesterday. It isn't going to happen. That's one of the things people think about you. If you say one thing, then do another, and nobody quite knows where you stand. What, what well, happened with that? Deal uh, with that particular I will one. Deal with that Why did you announce first, this tax? So the mischaracterizations from Eric were legion, but the but start, deal with this start one with first, the luxury the tax. tax. So I announced the Gucci tax. The Gucci I announced tax, the feasibility study. I would like Treasury Commission to do certain things, and one of them I added at the end was have a feasibility study into whether a higher rate of VAT could be applied to premium goods, and luxury had you goods. Told Nigel, my, 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 told Nigel leader, Farage, my leader no. wasn't so concerned with the feasibility of it as the desirability of it, and he is the leader of it. But isn't that the problem and with Nigel Farage? Like it's, it. it's all headline politics. You, you just make it up as you go along. If well, you go on your website, which I have tried to do, believe me, over the past fortnight, I mean, it's like, it's like following some, some sort of space age game, because things come up, things come down, we can't work out what you're doing. And if you go around the country and you say to people, you know, tell me who's in UKIP, they'll say Nigel Farage. And with the best respect to the rest of you, nobody has a clue. If Nigel Farage dies tomorrow, UKIP dies with him. Well, Let me just answer about I've the, been addressed. The, um, certainly, Nigel is incredibly important, but you say things unravel. We had two hours of debate with Nick Clegg, this alleged hero of the leaders' debates of 2010, and Nigel took him apart on issue after issue, winning clearly on points in the first one and the second one by a landslide. Now, as I go around the country, I have to say, Jeanette, and I don't know who you speak to, uh, I find people incredibly supportive of UKIP. I've been to Clacton, I think, seven times, and the people of Clacton and, indeed, Fr Frinton, and, and other parts of the constituency have been incredibly supportive and quite a lot of it has been on policy ideas as well as this feeling that, that Britain needs to Has it to been on policy ideas other than the EU and immigration? What other policy ideas have you had that have got really good support well, I, I other than the EU and immigration? One thing is people don't see why in this country uh, the rich should be able to afford a selective academic education for bright children and people who aren't rich aren't allowed that option. So that's another vote driver for my party. But I think Labour we're... have got a lot to say about that and so has the Liberal Democrats. It's not your party. Well, I think we're the only party saying that we would bring back the option of academic selection into the state education. I must bring Malcolm Bruce in. Malcolm, the Liberal, the Liberal Democrats are being shoved into fourth place by UKIP, aren't they? What, what's uh, going, well, at the moment, what, we still have 56 MPs. They don't yet have one. I mean, just, just... But we haven't had the general election. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just not get ahead of ourselves. All right. Um, I, I think, I think Boast what, that while the, you're able to. Uh, well, the point I would make is, first of all, uh, you've just said uh, we, we stand up for working people. So why do you want to cut taxes for the high earners and abolish inheritance tax if you're a party for working people? And I also agree with Jeanette. What actually happens is they throw out a policy which is to tease you in thinking they might believe in that. They see what the reaction is and then they disown it. You're left with no idea which policy's in, which policy's out. And that's fine by them, because if it's one you like, <laughs> even if they've rejected it, you vote for them. If it's one you don't like, they've got rid of it, so still vote for them. Uh, we've just had a party conference where we actually debated policy. The leader doesn't make our policy. Our party delegates at a conference make policy in a democratic fashion with properly considered ideas. Not this draw it out of a hat, toss it up, see what happens. There didn't seem and to that, be that many people there, Malcolm. Uh, there were a lot of conference. people there, as a matter of fact. All right, well, let's uh, not do tit for tat on that. Let's just hear from members of You said spectacles there. What about the people that benefit from the EU? What about you talk about all these drawbacks we get from the EU, but there's some people, people from the UK can go move over to Europe. We can get an education in Europe. The single market that benefits our domestic trade and businesses. But you want it, the decision to leave will be based, I believe, mainly on dissatisfaction in the political system now. And it's a decision that we can't really go back on and we will lose going over to be able to go over to move in to European countries. We won't be able to go back on these, and these are benefits of, uh, of Europe. Things you don't seem okay. to talk about. What about Mr. Grant, who asked the question? What's your view? Uh, I think it's a combination of both. I think people are, are, do like some of the policies you're coming up with, and also they are, do want to protest uh, against, against the main parties. Um, Clacton's quite a poor town. Uh, half the average national minimum average wage is what is the average of Clacton. Mm. And Clacton, in my whole lifetime, has returned um, the. the party in government has been returned by Clacton, that's who Clacton vote for, and he's been let down in my lifetime and has, hasn't received any, any, any support really, and we haven't noticed it in Clacton, so people w want to have an option, a different option. OK, Eric Pickles? Well, I'm sorry that the gentleman feels like that. I mean, there are three and a half thousand uh, more jobs than when we came into office, and we're spending £36 million on a flood defence that, uh, were it not to be there, then, then perhaps Clacton and... Uh, 
you know, well, I, wouldn't I be here. Holland, where the flood defence does fine, but Jaywick, the other end of town, is one of mm. the poorest walls in the country. Clacton has oh, been fouled by the oh. establishment. Well, I, I accept Jaywick is one of the most deprived areas. But, but forgive me, I, wonder, I don't want to pick on Patrick, but could I just ask uh, some clarification on the health service? Your deputy leader, who I presume is a very important man, says that the very idea of, of the National Health Service offends him, that it's, uh, that, that it, that it's against competition and he feels it should be broken up. Is that your policy? Well, you know it's not our policy, and what he said Is was... Is he wrong? Many years ago, what he said was... He said it this year. He, no, he didn't. The NHS, uh, he felt, uh, wasn't... Uh, particularly compatible with the idea of competition. But we as a party are 100% in favour of the NHS. And what's more, we're the one party that's saying that this TTIP uh, thing that, that, that's coming that we haven't been able to see... Hang on, let me finish. Yeah. Uh, we are the party that says we want medical services in the NHS exempted from that agreement, which not even the Labour Party... All right, so I, hold on, I'm going to go to the man at the back. Let's yeah, hear from some more members of the audience. You, sir. Um, to the UK candidate, I completely agree with you that there needs to be a protest, but the fact of the matter is you, that you're not the party to deliver that protest because you're part of the Westminster elite that you, ha uh, that you uh, say that you hate. The fact that, uh, for example, I think uh, your candidate for, um, I, I don't know if I'm 100% right, but your candidate for this by-election, as a Conservative MP, actually claimed a million in it for his house in um, London. In addition to that, um, I don't think you can ever truly be a party of the working people when your leader is an ex-banker. Okay. <laughs> It's a common refrain of UKIP that all the three main parties are the same. Well, they are the same in one respect. Their supporters don't go around abusing and harassing other people because we allegedly <laughs> get all the corners in. We allegedly what, sorry? We, the, the supporters of the main parties don't go around abusing and insulting their opponents on the basis that they let all the foreigners in, that they should go back to London, that they let, the, that they let Muslims live in this town. Oh, and by the way, immigration, uh, the last census of tendering revealed that 97.6% of the population is quite British. There's no immigrants here. There's no immigrants, immig immigrant problem here. The problem here is deprivation. The problem here is poor GP service. The problem here is um, lack of investment. There's no need to get upset about immigration. So if that's this. true, why is, it, why is UKIP... Unfortunately, there is a level of bigotry in this area. The BNP uh, are polled quite respectably in previous council elections, and I'm afraid an element of the UK vote is, is racist. Can I hear from... We've got... We've... <laughs> I know we have, we have UKIP members here in the audience. The accusation was that elements of the UKIP vote is racist. Is there a UKIP member here who'd like to speak to that? Any, are you, uh, you, uh, who, uh, who, just one, uh, one UKIP voter, can I have a hand up for? Yes, you sir, yes? My, my, with this European thing with UKIP, yeah. I've got nothing about, I, no problem with coming out of Europe, but what I do object to is the amount of money we put into Europe. To me, the European Parliament is a gravy train. Right, it's been said several times, the and we don't get anywhere near the, um, the amount coming back into this country. Okay, and you, sir? I think the reason UKIP uh, are going to win tonight is not because of UKIP. I think it's because of Douglas Carswell. He's a good MP. He's been a good MP. <laughs> uh, for Clapton. Okay, and the, and the man up there at the back, on the left. Yes, you, sir? Yeah, just to go back on the point about the NHS, uh, I think it's laughable that there's, uh, there's three members from the three main parties here who um, are trying to take them all high ground on the NHS when they've allowed PFI contracts to financially yeah, ruin yeah. the NHS. <laughs> OK, and you say yes. Um, I'll make a comment. My father was born in Poland, and as a young man in the 1920s, saw will borrow money across the border in East Prussia, in the Weimar Republic. Um, it was laden down with debt. Now, we look across to Europe, and we have a lot of the countries in Europe in serious trouble because of economic mismanagement, debt and what have you. Um, and I say, whether we're in Europe or outside of Europe, we still have a problem in sorting out Europe. I mean, much better sorting out Europe being part of Europe, because if Europe goes down, it'll pull us down too, whether we're in it or outside of it. OK. And, and the lady here on the left. Uh, can we sort out Clacton? Because, but for this defection, if Clacton never gets any, any headlines at all, nobody ever mentions Clacton. Let's think about Clacton. But, 
but so, so Carswell leaving the Tories and joining UKIP has drawn attention to Clacton in a good way, you think? Yes. About time that Clacton got some acknowledgement uh, about his deprivation. Right. And you, sir, on the right there. The MP for the last I, I personally think my biggest concern with UKIP is that we seem to have a politics of them and us and a, a basic psychology of the in-group and the out-group. Can we not look at the problems of the country rather than kind of peddling a hate politics or a very much attacking other sections of society? Because it just concerns me because we used an argument earlier on that um, Nigel Farage, a fantastic, fantastic articulator, I know many fantastic articulators. It doesn't mean they should be running a country. Yes, you. People keep saying about Douglas Carswell and how great he is for this town. In 2006, I took some pupils down to interview the chair of the Cross Parliamentary Committee on Coastal Towns, and she told us Douglas Carswell never asked a question, never went to a meeting, did not raise the issue of this town once. So I would refute that. <laughs> Hang on. And you, you sir, yes. Yeah, I, was, I was a member of the Labour Party for 60-odd years, and I moved to Clacton in April this year, and the Labour Party couldn't even be bothered. And Douglas has answered every question I've asked him since I've been here. OK, well, conflicting views about Douglas Carswell. And we, we've heard that the turnout was 50%. Apparently, that's the first bit of information that's that's come through. That's low. It's low. What? You think it's quite high? I, you think I it's think, low? I, g given all the, the think it, What do you think it is? I think that's low. I, I, this is not the beginning of the great revolution that we're talking about. No. And in debt, would Douglas Carswell be, uh, be, the, be winning this by-election? He hadn't already got in on another party. And from what you can tell me, he may or may not have been a good MP, but if Clacton hasn't been heard of in Parliament, it's Douglas Carswell that hasn't been talking about Clacton in Parliament, it would seem to me. OK. Well, All right. Well, we'll come back on some of these. Uh, you, uh, uh, very, quick very, very, very briefly, I'm sure you'll be able to... Well, first of all, the gentleman talking about us and them or whatever. The whole point of politics is to debate on the allocation of scarce resources, to sort of try and sort of be tree-hugging, lovey-dovey, you never have to make a tough decision. Well, if that's your politics, it's not mine. You have to make moral choices in politics, and UKIP is offering that, and people are responding to it. And as for Douglas Carswell not responding to thing X, he's been... He's put himself before the people of Clacton, um, and we'll get a balanced verdict from the people of Clacton tonight, won't we? Well, and if your verdict is, is typical... <laughs> Well, it's called democracy. This is the way the system arranges accountability. It's a by-election. Uh, go on. You, you think what? You think the election is not? Yeah, it's what I mean. Scaremongering in the Daily Mail. What scaremongering? What scaremongering are you talking about? Me by saying, yes. Well, I'm a tree hugger, I'm, I'm very intelligent, I can yeah. articulate many subjects, but it was just talking about UKIP policies picking oh, on particular sections yeah. of society and basing whole political agenda around that. It's discourse and it's getting into the public consciousness, and I don't yes. necessarily think that's a good thing when there are so many things in this country that need rectify and sort out at a high level, yes, but at the moment, I don't see the, the policies coming from your party that are actually going to answer these bigger issues. You're, we're, just, we're, scaremongering. you're just scaremongering, yes. Well, look, you're entitled to your views. We will see how reflective your views are of the people of Clacton and what they actually believe when we see the result of the by-election tonight. Harriet Harman, are you surprised the turnout is only half those entitled to vote? Well, in by-elections, usually, I think the average is about 35%. Mm. So, for a by-election, it's quite high. Um, but, you know, it is disappointing that more people don't vote. But I think, you know, Patrick, to follow up on you, what you said, you said, well, we'll see what people have, have voted, and obviously we will by the time all the ballots are counted. But I think after that people will actually look much more seriously at all the things you're saying about tax, about the health service, about jobs, what the implications would be of just pulling out of Europe for jobs and people's living standards. And at that point, you can actually see, whether, we'll actually see whether all those things you add up. And the point that you made, I think that this is something, and I know Patrick says kind of acceptable face of, of the situation, but there is a sense that somehow... UKIP's politics is feeding on the, on the sense of division, and I think that that is quite worrying and quite dangerous. You said the back. If Douglas Carswell does win tonight, how long before UKIP has a change of leadership? Ah. <laughs> well, I, I can help here. 
Uh, very briefly, in one very word. Very underreported. We had a, a leadership election in UKIP about three weeks ago, uh, and Nigel Farage was re elected unopposed, and I was his campaign manager, and I thought <laughs> that was a good bit of business. <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's, let's, we'll, keep you, we'll keep you abreast of any news we get from the count. We have contacts um, in our party, I have to say, for leadership. <laughs> yes. Well, you might have one soon, that's certainly true. No, we won't. Let, let's have, oh, let's have a, a, a second question from Jane Osborne, please. If the NHS and social care services are at breaking point, is ring fencing spending enough for another five years? Ring fencing the NHS, if the, the care <coughs> and social care services in the NHS are at breaking point, is it enough? Jeanette Winterson, I mean, this is obviously the key argument that is one of the arguments going to dominate the election, which is how much the NHS needs and how much it's being promised by the various candidates for power. Well, one Office. of the things that's come up tonight is, 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 the, is this question of the NHS and competition. Um, I don't think that the NHS and competition are words that should actually go together, which is not about mismanagement or wasting money. It's about accepting that we have to find a way of funding the NHS that we all love and support, that is really a pillar of British society, um, and to do this in a, in, a, in a rational way, in a debated way, but not in a way that's there to make money for drug companies, for the pharmaceuticals, it's not there for American health companies to come in and start providing services through the free market, through the privatised market, which sadly I think is what the Conservatives have in mind. I think we need a very different NHS service. But, the, but, but I, given, that, given that NHS England says that by 2020 there'll be a funding gap of £30 billion yeah. in the NHS. How, well, would you fill, what, how would you fill that gap? Here's what I'd like to do first. I mean, at the minute, we, we, you know, what we're not using is, are the sophisticated tools of the web and the internet to engage the whole of the country in meaningful debate. You know, we just had a Scottish referendum. There are other ways of talking about the health service. I'd like every person in England to get online, to answer a questionnaire, to say, what do you want to see funded? What are your priorities? What matters to you, to us, to all of us, about the health service? And have that information brought in, that would be direct democracy in a way that would be really possible now and we don't do it. And then well, you might find that this supposed 30 billion funding gap isn't going to be the kind of funding gap that you mean. You know, we don't, nobody's ever asked us what things we want to prioritise, what things we want to fund, all of us. We need to be in that conversation, not just politicians. And the technology is there to let everybody be in that conversation and then we could really start talking about the health service. All right. Malcolm, Malcolm Bruce. Um, well, I don't think it, it's enough, and that's one of the reasons why we uh, have indicated that we would find more money for the health service over and above uh, the, the inflation element. Um, and, and fact, how, how much over? Uh, well, Danny, Danny Alexander says once the, the, the um, public finances are balanced in 2017 onwards, an extra billion... Not um, much, is it, considering well, it, 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 20 it, billion is what's been called? I, I accept that... I mean, that's the interesting point. Well, I think... The NHS goes on getting yes, bigger and needing more money well, all the I, time. I, I, we, we certainly... It is always under challenge. Let's be realistic about it. We've got to try and find ways of spending the money efficiently and delivering it on the spot. But I think another important thing is that we've announced this week is the prioritisation of mental health and the recognition that mental health and physical health go together and indeed there's a great Latin slogan about a healthy mind and a healthy body and yet there are no targets, no priorities for mental health. We genuinely believe that prioritising mental health, making targets for mental health mm. starting from this year will actually help ease the pressures across the whole of the health service and we've said of this extra billion pounds, half of it will go into mm. delivering mental but health But Malcolm, uh, you're, you're, you're a canny man, I mean in terms of the gap between the, NH the demand for the NHS and what the political parties are offering. I mean, it's huge. And to pretend that any of the political parties are able to fill the gap or solve the problem surely is fantasy land. Well, uh, yeah, but I think the we have a difficulty here. Let's be honest about it. Well, let's be honest. It, it, is, it is our great sacred institution that mm. everybody wants to protect and support. Mm. It's very difficult to have a debate about mm. saying to people, maybe we should have a little contribution here for this aspect, the food, the hotel, the prescriptions. It's all anathema. But we do probably have to have that debate. I'll put it the other way around. We've just had a referendum in Scotland, by the way, where the SNP tried to make out the health policy in England was a reason for voting for independence. And it was then revealed that although the money's been given to the Scottish Government, they've spent less on the health service in Scotland than has been the case in England per capita and in terms of the increase. And what have they done with it? They've abolished prescription charges, they've abolished parking charges in hospitals, which means the car parks have to be funded out of the clinical budget. So naked populism has actually weakened the health service and it's, and it's happened elsewhere. So I do agree it's a difficult debate. All I can say as a party, we've at least acknowledged that simply inflation protecting the health service is not 
not enough, and we've made a commitment for extra money and how to find it. And I really want to repeat, mental health has been the underdog of the health service. 25% of people who go to the NHS or don't go to the NHS are suffering from mental health disorders. It is time that changed, right. and we gave proper respect to mental illness, and we treated it the same way we treat uh, the other kind of illness. Eric Pickles, in your view, as the election approaches, is there a clear distinction between the main parties on how they would handle the NHS? One that voters can say, well, I now know what they're going to do, and I know what they're going to do. Well, I think is, is, is either side offering enough? Well, forgive me for, um, for making a narrow political point. You can do that now. Uh, the coalition have protected the health service. Uh, waiting lists have gone down. We've done various things. If you look in terms of what happened in, in Wales, where, where Labour's in charge, uh, we've seen problems with cancer care, we've seen problems with waiting, and we've seen real cuts in the, in the health service. But look, I, I don't know about you, but I'm just sick to death of all this sort of you know, bidding about a bit of extra. I think we need to look in terms of what the health service does. And I think the biggest challenge that the health service face and what society face is trying to get proper integration between medical care and social care for the most vulnerable, particularly the elderly. And, you know, as long as I've been in politics, we've tried to do that. Uh, the coalition here is trying with a better care fund to try and make that transition uh, from, from somebody um, who is getting on, who is, get, uh, who is very vulnerable, to find that they can, can spend the, the, the remaining of the life with a degree of dignity. We started with a relatively modest sum of uh, three and a half billion pounds. Local authorities have, have come up with a challenge, so we've got it up to, uh, to, to five, and, five and a half billion pounds. And right across the country, local authorities and uh, the health service are working together to get that thing so that you know, people aren't torn apart, people aren't uh, separated from their loved ones, people can live out their, their life very, very how reasonably. How do you do that when you said you're going to? Um, complete the elimination of the deficit by simply cutting public well, services. Well, I have to tell you, I'm working hand in glove with, uh, with Danny Alexander to do exactly that. Yeah, but we've said we're prepared um, to raise taxes. I'm, on the wealthy, you said you won't. Uh, but, well, I'm sorry you're making this rather narrow point. Uh, <laughs> the point is, the Coalition has agreed to that. We're committed to it. I hope you're committed to that. If we can do that, as a byproduct of that, it will save an awful lot of money and we can, and, and we can actually transfer right. it to other parts of the health but it is worthwhile doing but in itself. Jane, Jane Osmond's question was, is ring-fencing well, spending is. enough? But it is, is enough? But, it, but it is ring-fencing, and the answer no, is no, it's no, not because, enough, we're, no. because we're looking towards, to spread it wider. You, sir. The NHS really needs more money put into it, but also it could help itself by doing away with a lot of these managers that are... Yeah that are in the hospital. OK. Uh, my, Harry, uh, OK. Ha my, yes, go on, sorry. I was going to say, my, my wife used to be uh, a war clerk at a, a hospital in Essex. She left. They brought in, instead, a business manager for a hospital, a business manager. And then he decided he had too much work. He brought in an assistant. Nobody replaced my wife on a ward uh, as a war clerk. She, that position was left vacant for two years. OK. And you, sir? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the NHS is a fantastic, um, you know, organisation, and obviously, you know, we all use it, or we will all use it at some point in our lives. Um, I agree with the gentleman uh, there that there's too many managers. If you look at the local primary care trusts, whether it's, you know, around here or somewhere else, there's too many managers, too many people in offices not doing anything. Um, and that's gradually increasing year on year, um, where there's not enough nurses, not enough doctors, and, and that's where the money's going, I think, in the primary care trusts. That's, can, that's where it's being lost. Can I come back to Jane Osborne, who asked the question? What do you think of the answers you've heard so far? I think they're really wishy-washy and vague. I, I want them to actually grasp the nettle and say, look, we have got this massive gap, and yes, we will increase taxes or national insurance, and be honest about it, the British public really care about the NHS, and I think they're happy to pay for it if they need to. <laughs> Well, I think ring fencing isn't enough money. I, I completely agree with you on that. And the other thing is that the NHS is 
incredibly good value for money compared to other health systems. If you look at the American system or even health systems in other European countries, we spend less as a percentage of our national income on the NHS and get far better health services as a result. So the idea of moving to a different system I would be totally against. Obviously, there's improvements that can be made. But I think that you know, Eric Pickle's description uh, it just does not meet reality and there is a simple truth that's happened on this is that I can remember when they were in power before we came in in 97 where people used to come and see me breaking down in tears because they would be waiting two years for a hip replacement and they couldn't even go on a GP waiting list and they would have to appeal to go on a GP waiting list and when we came into government we actually put lots more investment in the NHS to bring the waiting list down and have more GPs. And actually, the truth is, what's happened since the coalition have got in is that people can't get a GP appointment again. And it's not true that waiting lists are going down. I don't know what planet Harriet, Eric Pickles you is gave living us on. Mid Staffordshire and, actually, and Morecambe Bay. You gave us Mid Staffordshire. Mid, mid Staffordshire. People, Wait, just a minute, Eric. I'm, just a minute. Just, just a minute. People who Mid couldn't even get a drink. They were, they were neglected because they were trying to hit your targets. Eric, it is outrageous to say that the whole, to tarnish the whole of the NHS or to try and tarnish the Labour government because of mid-Staffordshire, which everybody in the NHS thought was absolutely terrible. So I think that that is disreputable for you to try and undermine the NHS to say that actually it was all like mid-Staffordshire. And I think that's a very well, disreputable words into thing mouth. to do. I think that but are you going to apologise to Mid Staffordshire because it was a failure of management? Uh, can we I, can all I... felt, Wait a everybody felt terrible about Mid Staffordshire, but that was not an emblem for the NHS. That but, was things going massively wrong in the healthcare system but, but, that should never have been allowed to happen. And Harriet, you said at the beginning of this, ring fencing wasn't enough. How much more? The lady over there was saying you should just put up taxes and spend money on the NHS. How much more money are you going to be saying you'll be spending? Well, the we Liberal Democrats are saying another billion. I'm well, sure we said that we would put in a new fund called Time to Care to get more doctors, more nurses, more GPs that would have two and a half billion pounds, but we recognise that still wouldn't meet the funding gap, which has been estimated at £30 billion. And we want to do more on the NHS because we believe it's good value for <laughs> and money. that's and halfway you know, through the thing, next parliament if well, you're in power, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And Not it, straight away. Well, you know, you get working on it straight away. But one of the things that I think we should bear in mind is that is the people who actually are not paying tax at all or not paying their fair share of tax. And HMRC's estimate, and this was brought out by the Public Accounts Committee, is that there is £35 billion of unpaid tax in this country, and that's before you go to Google and Starbucks and Amazon. If some of them paid their taxes, then actually we could have some of that money going into that. <laughs> Woman on, on the left there. Yes, you. Oh, sorry. No, I, I didn't. I'm so sorry. You didn't have a microphone. And I, I'll come to you in a moment. I meant the woman there in the striped. I'm, sorry. I'm so you. sorry. I will come back to you though. I think, as users of the NHS, we should be more responsible and turn up for our, okay. our appointments. Right. And um, I would be prepared to pay more for my prescription charges. I think they're very cheap. A lot of the medicine that we buy is very expensive. I think if that was put up, it would help to contribute to the main bill. But I think we should be more responsible users as well. Uh, that people could who could afford would pay, or that everybody should be charged? Or how would you... I think the charges are very reasonable, but okay. um, I, think, I think we should pay more. And now you have the microphone. Right. Um, I have a very good GP practice in Clacton. Everybody moans they can't get an appointment. This morning I found out that we have a walk-in clinic for one and a half hours every morning Then we can see our doctor on the same day. Also, I had a cancer operation in Colchester General last November, and it was absolutely excellent. At the time, they were getting the very bad publicity on cancer patients. But what, I in did Colchester? In Colchester. Yeah. I did see an awful lot of waste of money, just, just like a layperson's point of view. For example, hiring a private ambulance to take me 10 minutes across the town for a procedure before the operation and then to take me back. Whereas if they'd given my husband a parking ticket to go into the Essex County Hospital, mm -hmm. he would have done, it, done it for it. free. Right. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Patrick Griffin.
Well, far be it from me uh, to defend Harriet from Eric's demand for an apology, and mid-staffs was a total disgrace. But perhaps, Eric, you would like now to apologise on behalf of a Prime Minister who promised no further top-down reorganisations of the NHS and then inflicted the biggest top-down reorganisation it's ever seen, with managers being made redundant from one arm and reappointed fire another arm and I've seen I yeah. couldn't work out what was going on in Andrew Lansley's head if you let me finish uh, I think he was just jealous of Michael Gove having some big overarching reform and thought I want one too and David Cameron broke his promise to the British people about their most precious public service you've asked for Harriet to apologize will you apologize to, for, for him that reorganization produced more doctors more nurses more midwives that re that reorganization reduced the number of um, more redundancy of, of, of uh, of administrations. We've brought in procedures now whereby we will get money back for people who have been made redundant and then are reapplied. Uh, so how about a bit of praise, Patrick? How about a bit of praise? What, We've actually got people promise, doing things, for not promising promise, one thing on one side of the country you, and another thing on another side of the country. Your Prime Minister broke a promise, just like on immigration, throughout. Eric. He seems very quick to ask for You're apologies right. from other people, but very slow to offer them. But Eric, them can yourself. I ask you a question? No, of course yeah. you can. So it's simply this, that, um, with, if your government gets into power again, how much do you intend to open up the National Health Service to private companies? Well, I, I don't understand why you're obsessed by this. What it should be about is about treating people and making well, sure our population... Well, because private companies exist for profit, that's our, why. Our, our object is, is to treat people and to make people better and to ensure people have dignity. Now, to, to turn your back and say, oh, well, we can't possibly do that, only the state can do that. I've, I am completely, no, I am completely supportive of, of, our, of our health service that is free at the point mm. of delivery. You know, there's all this idea, with could, great could respect... You, could you just, Eric, could you just answer my question, please? I want to know whether the Tories will, what, 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 what will open up the NHS to, you, to private what companies I'm, what if I'm actually they get saying into to power. You, is I don't care whether it's private companies or it's a state, providing we ensure that the health service is, uh, is free at the point of delivery. But this word I free want, is very deceiving. Private I companies exist for profit. There's nothing free about private. Look, I've got, I've got constituents in my part. <laughs> I just want you to this, answer my question. Well, really let, me, let, me answer, question. let me answer the question. I have got patients, I have got constituents in my patch who are getting, by going to a private clinic, pay through the health service, they're getting seen quicker, uh, they're, they're getting treated quick, uh, quicker, they're getting their, uh, their problems dealt with quicker that way. Under your system... What does all, it cost the taxpayer? All, 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 under uh, your system, people would suffer and they would have to wait longer, it, and I find it, that completely can, morally can I, repulsive. No, can I, hold on, hold on, but the two of you. Are you saying, so Nick, I, it's all right. are you saying that the use of the private sector is more expensive for the taxpayer in the long run? Yes. E even if it's more, even if it gives quicker it, 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 service? What we, is what it, is we, that true or false? What, I, what, well, what we false. see... It's false. It doesn't cost any more to go private? Uh, uh, no, if the contracts are, are, are organised. You know, the, the health services are enormous. Uh, I mean, no, I know it's enormous. And, it, it, and it's got Jeanette's big bang point and, and the point I is, under Labour and us, we can't have that, that kind of artificial way of looking at things. It, it's not that, artificial. It, it is, There's nothing it, artificial it about saying, is this for profit me. or is it not? That's a very straightforward question. And a very straightforward question is... Give me a straightforward answer. What is it, yes or no? The, and the straightforward answer is, I don't accept your... Uh, doctrinal view. I believe we should treat patients and we should be treated early. Often, Look, if just tell all right, me, no, I think uh, we've had, or not. All right, no, you're not going to get an answer there. And, no. and I think okay. it's, well, you because want it's, because it's, it's entirely it false. Don't argue. Don't argue. I mean, it'd be it, difficult with me. It's entirely a false argument. All right. We should it's be women, treating you know, people. Eric, they're difficult. I just right. want to know. No, I know whether you do. Uh, I, he's it, not going to tell me. Well, is he? fine. Let's leave it there. As you'll discover. You heard it here. As you'll discover, you've asked the question five, six times. If you haven't had an answer, you aren't going to get one at the seventh attempt. So let's move on right. to it. And we'll move on to another point. Um, another question altogether. Nigel Stephen, please. Nigel Stephen. Would members of the panel support the cutting of overseas aid to help reduce the national debt after the next election? OK, members of the panel, would you reduce the uh, cutting... Would you, exp uh, would you support the cutting of overseas aid? Uh, OK, Patrick O'Flynn, you go for it. Well, look, this is one of the areas where UKIP's offered new choices to the British public. When I was a political journalist, I used to sit in the press gallery of the House of Commons and they would all congratulate each other for the cross-party uh, support for this arbitrary 0.7% of GDP uh, going on foreign aid. And, and they would elevate that because what they were really saying was if we all 
the whole monopoly goes with this one position, then the fact that polls show most of the public don't agree with it uh, will have no traction. We'll be able to do it anyway. Uh, we say uh, it's ridiculous at a time like this to just be stuck on that arbitrary target. We believe much aid is wasted, that long-term bilateral programmes with corrupt foreign regimes uh, result in money going where it shouldn't. We believe in prioritising emergency relief uh, inoculations against infectious diseases. Would certainly. you be spending money on Ebola now? Oh, you certainly. Well, that? Ebola is scale? exactly what foreign aid is for. There's no doubt oh, about that. Uh, what it's not for is the very long-term huge bilateral programmes which actually uh, undermine the incentives for countries to, to go for trade and economic development and responsible government, and uh, money drains right. away. Ebola is absolutely what foreign aid should be for, and the contingency reserves as well, better spent on our troops going to Sierra Leone, where I'm sure they'll do a brilliant job, than on fighting dodgy foreign wars with no particular uh, end game at the behest of the United States. Well, the ISIS. Well, ISIS, if you want me to talk about that... No, I'm just uh, checking out what you were referring to. Well, I... Dodgy, okay, dodgy I just, if, Yeah, well, if I just make a very quick point on that. A year ago, David Cameron wanted to bomb the Syrian regime and arm the rebels. And now, a year later, he, he, he wants to bomb the rebels. Well, okay. if we'd gone with Plan A, we'd have probably have ISIS in charge in Damascus already. Har Harriet Hum. Rubbish. Not Harry rubbish, Hum. my opinion, sir. Um, no, I don't think that we should um, cut international development support uh, for the national debt. I really don't. I think, I think it's a very, very small percentage. It's less than 1%. Um, of our public spending, no, and of, if there are people of GDP, not of GDP of public yes, of GDP, even less, and and basically, if there are people starving in the world because they're in very poor countries, I think the idea that we should then turn are back on them and say, sorry, we're not going to give you anything and you can die of starvation because although we're, relatively speaking, a wealthy country, we've got to look after ourselves. I think we're more altruistic um, and more internationalist and more humane in this country. But, but secondly, I think it's also good in terms of helping other countries get on their feet and develop and then they can have good relations and trade with us. And if you think of a country that's developed where we've got good relations but we no longer give aid to, but we used to, like India, mm. they are massively important trading partners for us. So I think that we should carry on uh, with our international ed development budget. And also, UKIPS, I thought it was your proposal that we should actually abolish the Department of International Development. And if ever there was an example of why we need it, look at the Ebola situation in Sierra Leone. We need that help with their health services. We need that out of humanity because of the awful effect of the disease on them, but also because this is a global issue. And I don't think we should be a mean, narrow-minded, inward-looking country that only looks out for ourselves. I think that is depressing, and I don't hold right. with that. Right. <laughs> Nigel Stephen, who asked the question, what's your view? Well, I'm inclined to uh, go with what Harriet Harman's just said, because the idea that none of this aid is tied and it's just given and we don't get anything back in return just is not true. And actually, if you were to trim down uh, that 0.7% that Patrick has mentioned and uh, look at the sort of reciprocity of it, what we get back, and then you actually look at in proportion to what the national debt is, we're looking at a tiny, tiny fraction uh, in terms of reducing it. So that's why I go along Does with Does anybody here support what uh, Patrick Griffin said about it, that... that Yes, you, sir. Um, I'd like to know, Harriet Harman, where Brazil are a much more developed economy than Britain now, and we're still actually giving them money. And you mentioned China. Overseas aid still goes to China. So I'm all for protecting overseas aid for countries of need, but with countries of greater economic output than Britain, why should it go to them? Uh, Eric Pickles, do you like to answer that? Yeah, but I, I want to just say something I said. No, could you ask, answer him first, because that's the way the programme works. No, I'm not. <laughs> My experience of the programme is we say what we like and you just try and stop us. I just want to say, I agree with what, uh, what Harriet said. I think it's absolutely right. You know, it, it would be entirely wrong. Now, of course, there are some places that we're given that are prosperous. We used to give a lot of money to, to India, but we've gradually moved out to a position where, where we didn't. We were still India giving it. India had to tell us to stop giving it because they didn't want it. Well, we... <laughs> 
we run down this, we run down a series of programs, but you can't get away from the fact, Patrick. If we haven't got, uh, if we haven't got this program, there is no way in the relatively short time we could have pushed up the uh, the, the aid to Sierra Leone. It would have been impossible to start from from nothing. And there are people, there are girls getting an education in, in parts of um, of the, of the Far East and in Asia that wouldn't have got an education without British aid. Right. And it's in our interest to do so. We are a small nation. Nation, but we are a big trading nation and it is in our interest to ensure that there is literacy, that there is clean water and that people get a good education. Now can you put your question Mr. again? Mr Pickles, is um, overseas aid to fund um, space programmes? No. No, uh, no uh, clearly it is, it is not been used to, uh, to fund well, a, a space why programme. Why have you got a space it's programme? A, it's kind of a very interesting idea but I don't think we'll be using it for that. Well, clearly I've Mark, been... Malcolm Bruce. Well, I've had the privilege of chairing the International Development Select Committee of the House of Commons for the last nine years, and I have been all over Africa um, and Asia looking at UK's aid programmes. Um, and I absolutely do believe they both serve the, the global interest and actually Britain's national interest. But we don't do it in order to get a return on investment. We do it to lift people out of poverty because we actually care about it. But we want to do it in a way that's sustainable. I was a few months ago in Sierra Leone and Liberia at the beginning of the Ebola outbreak. And the UK and indeed the United States have been working there to build up their health capacity. But we haven't got far enough down the road for them to be able to withstand the particular threat they have now. What I hope we will do is put more resources in to tackle the problem, but also leave a legacy where they can cope with su such a yeah, problem in the future. That's a sound investment for them and for us. And you think we try to eliminate AIDS, malaria. These are all diseases that threaten the whole planet, not just these people over there that apparently we don't care about. These people over there are our all brothers right. and sisters who we should care about, we do care about, and we have a capacity to help them help themselves, lift them out of poverty, and create a world which is much more unified, okay. less prone to violence, less prone to migration. It's a very good investment. We should be proud of the fact that we are the second largest donor in the world, and I hope when Michael Moore's bill passed through Parliament, we will enshrine in law that 0.7% will be our commitment okay. for the future. Thank you. Precisely so that you Thank you very much, Malcolm Bruce. And <laughs> Jeanette Woodson, very briefly, if you would. I want to make one other question here. I think, I, think we all, I think we're all on the same side here. I mean, right, possibly well, then, not UKIP. Mean, no. Not UKIP, but in what kind of a country do we want to be? We're a wealthy country, you know, we're a big player in the world. We can afford it. It's morally right. Of course we've got to keep the aid going. All right. Thank you very much. Jo can I just clarify one thing with you, Mr Pickles, since... Mr. Your, thank you, Mr. Pickles. Yeah. Um, can I clarify one thing with you? That why did the government switch its policy today? In the morning, they were taking the World Health Organization's view that there was no point in screening in the UK, and then this afternoon it suddenly switched. Uh, just tell us for yeah, well, purposes of information what it was. That I mean, the World changed. Health uh, uh, medical uh, opinion is immensely important, but also we took advice from our chief medical officer. His advice changed. I want to absolutely emphasize. The risk has not increased, but it was felt uh, that in terms of screening within this country, it would act as an extra precaution and would be worthwhile uh, doing. So it's on the medical advice that we've taken. All right, thank you very much. We've got time for a last question from Susan Jones, please. Susan we, Jones, I have no more news at the moment together, about the by-election. Yes, Susan Jones. If we are all in it together, should MPs' wages and expenses be frozen like other public sector wages? Yes, uh, um, <laughs> You'll have to be swift on this, but uh, MP salaries are going up to 74,000 um, and uh, it's rise by 10% or something. Malcolm Bruce, should they take it? Should it be stopped? What's going to happen? Well, I'm in the fortunate position of not standing at the next election, so I won't have, a, have to make that decision. I just would say that they have, in fact, been frozen for three years and increased for 1% this year and last, in, in common with all the other sectors in the public sector. But I completely agree, when we have a deficit that is where it is now, uh, it's extremely difficult for MPs to justify taking that kind of increase. In the long run, we do have to get MPs' pay in the right place but I have to say, the timing couldn't be worse. OK. Mm. Uh, if if uh, Douglas Carswell uh, wins here tonight and is in the House of Commons mm. next time round, do you think he should take the increase to 74,000? Well, you have to ask Douglas what he wants, but I tell you what my, I, my view is on MPs' pay, is that it should be pegged to a fixed percentage of average earnings, and that way every MP will have an incentive for the average working person to progress and get better off. 
because that, their pay will be pegged to that. So the overall economic fortunes of the nation will determine how well off MPs are. And I think if you did that, you could solve these problems for good. Uh, do you agree with your leader that they should be paid between 90 and 100,000 pounds, not 74,000 pounds? Um, actually... If you knew that was his policy, which perhaps you didn't. Well, I think MPs' pay is, is a question that every MP will have their view on. I don't think uh, MPs are underpaid. I think once you, you count in the pension scheme that it, it's, it's, you don't go into public service to get rich. Uh, and I, as I say, my view is it should be pegged to average earnings. Right. Harriet Harman, what do you think should be done? Well, I was just wondering what Patrick thought about um, members of the European yeah. Parliament paying. You want me to answer that? that? Yeah. Well, 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 you're, well, well, you're giving up your own time. Oh, yeah. right. You're giving up your own time because you've only got well, a few minutes. Okay. Asked I'll, me. Well, I'll answer very quickly right. in order that we can hear from Patrick on MEPs. We've proposed that actually ministers' pay should not be frozen but should be cut by 5% as part of the deficit, and that's what we could do in government. But actually, our view is that MPs should not be voting on our own pay. That is absolutely the wrong thing to do. It should be set independently, but as far as the government is concerned, if we were in government, we would control that and we would start by cutting ministers' pay by 5%. All right. Eric Pickles, do you think the, the, I, I, the, the I, system should be abolished and I, people I, should I, take the money? I started out and I had a 5% cut to my ministerial salary. Each time MPs have had an increase, my ministerial salary has been cut by that amount. When Labour were in and we had that uh, increase, I decided the time was wrong and I paid the amount that I got to a local charity. That's my decision and I'll take that decision uh, when, if and when we receive an increase. Uh, and, right, OK. Uh, do, do you think that there is, there is an argument that the House of Commons should turn its back on the system it set up? which has led to the 74,000. Do you think they should or not? I don't think it's been... I don't think this is Ipsos fine at the moment. The problem is, it's, I mean, the average, the average wage is 26,000, mm. isn't it? So, it, you know, it sounds like a lot of money. And, you know, that's difficult at the moment. And it's difficult for MPs to be suddenly saying, yes, we'll have a very large increase. You know, but... The idea of paying MPs in the first place started right back in the 1830s with Chartism and the idea of paying MPs was so that working men, as it was at the time, could stand for Parliament. So we've got to get this balance so that people can <coughs> serve the country and do it effectively without it looking like they are in fact in it for profit because I think whatever you say at the minute, 70 odd grand looks like pretty good money. Susan Jones, brief point from you. Yeah, I mean, I just think in this um, economic t times, we just can't say that we can pay and pay £74,000 a year yeah. when someone in Clapton is lucky to earn 10000 a year. OK. <laughs> well, we have, to, we have to stop there. Now, next week, Question Time is going to be in Newbury in Berkshire. We have Charles Kennedy and Amanda Platell among our panellists. The week after that, we're going to be in Liverpool, so if you want to come to either programme that's Newbury or Liverpool, go to our website, the address is always on the screen, or 0330-123-9988. If you've been listening to this on Radio 5 Live, as you know, the debate continues with Question Time Extra Time uh, here on the BBC. Andrew Neil will be here until the early hours of the morning with the result of this by-election. I haven't heard any more from the Count as this programme's gone on, which I'd rather hope we should. But anyway, he'll have that result. My thanks to our panel and thank to all of you who came here to Clacton to take part. Most of you, I think. How many of you voted? Hands up today. Brilliant. Well over 50% of our audience who voted. Thank you very much uh, from Clacton. Until next Thursday, good night. So stay with BBC One for tonight's by-election results. It's a this week's special. Next. Dementia is an illness full of...